For Crema Media's policy, I'm Sane Damini, Associate Professor in the Public and Development Management Department at the Graduate School of Business Administration at Beth University. William Kumete is in conversation with Polity about a children's book he wrote titled Upside Down World. So, Professor Kumete, can you tell us how the initiative of this children's book started? Um, yes, no, thank you. You know, I have been working um, on, I've been writing a few children's books and I'm still busy uh, with a few more. And, um, and the thing that struck me that I've always been interested in two things is, you know, firstly, if you have children, um, you know, how do you get them to do, go to bed, <laughs> wake up in the morning? Uh, and so, you know, that's like, I think all parents struggle with that sort of thing. And you know, how do I combine it? I try to combine it uh, with learning also about the environment and about how the world is, you know, the environment, ourselves and everything, we're all part of a system, a whole system. And if we disrupt um, part of the system, then the, you know, the whole system becomes upside down. I mean, that's really is the idea of the story is, you know, the son is a little boy. Um, he looks down one day and he's, and he just saw all the kids playing on such a lovely day. They're playing and, and he decides, well, he is not going to go to bed. He is not going to, he's going to, firstly, he's going to stay up there. And he, and also he wants the children to continue to sleep. Uh, now, I guess very late in the evening now, it's seven o'clock, it's eight o'clock, but his son is still up there and children down on earth don't want to go to bed because it's like, why? It's not dark. Um, uh, and so on. So, I mean, eventually, um, when um, um, the son eventually goes to bed after a whole lot of persuasion and, uh, and so the way we often try to persuade our children to go to bed, when the son eventually goes to bed, I mean, the whole world was upside down. Um, you know, um, the animals that roam during the day and are supposed to go and sleep and rest at night, they can't do that. The flowers also, and the flowers that comes out um, you know, you get animals coming out in, at night, even flowers, it comes out at night, don't come out, so the whole world was upside down. So the idea really is that, you know, um, we have to care about our world also, and, you know, and it's a system, it's like almost now with COVID-19, I mean, one of the reasons, we, and yet although it's not totally proven, is the sort of disruption in the, you know, in the environment, in our, in our, in our, in our system. Um, I mean, there are um, arguments that uh, the, the virus came from um, certain kind of animals that humans use uh, um, and you know those sort of things so why the system the environment and the system is very important to to maintain and there is a concern that children don't generally read why is reading so important especially for kids in our black communities Absolutely. I mean, the one big part of it, you know, and the reason why I'm writing for children is really is to try to get a culture of reading. I mean, I am where I am now because of a culture of reading. You know, the day, you know, I grew up in an informal settlement. And when I was about seven or eight, uh, one of my neighbors were about three or four years older than me. Um, had, um, you know, he'd gone to the library and, and we didn't have a library, you know, typically, you know, Black communities in Turkey about the 1970s. Um, it was a mobile library that comes once a week um, and then goes to another township and so on. And I saw him, I had seen him, uh, you know, a couple of times with books walking. And one day I asked him, where are you going? And he said, no, I'm going to the library. Um, and I asked him one day if I could go with him. And he said, yes, come along with him. And I went to that mobile library and that changed my life totally from there because I joined the library then and reading became for me a refuge throughout, um, you know, it opened new worlds for me. It showed that my world, you know, which seems confined in an informal settlement is not the end of the world. Um, you know, there are other worlds out there and it showed me also other kinds of people, other children my age, uh, you know, struggling with the same issues as I'm struggling. I'm not the only, you know, the loneliest person. <laughs> Um, in the world. There's others who are struggling with the same issues and, and conquering the, the issues. So it was very, very important. I mean, also my confidence through reading, um, you, you know, suddenly at, uh, at school, I performed better and you must, 
you know, just, just imagine this is the 1970s, so if you come from an informal settlement, there really isn't a culture of learning um, at all. I mean, I do remember, for example, that that friend of mine who was a few years older than me, I mean, he was out of that informal, not even informal settlement, most probably out of that part of the town, so was the only person who actually went on to higher education, uh, went on to high school as well, you know, the boys. And again, you know, I, would, I haven't talked to him about it, but I assume it was because he started reading. Uh, that was so important, uh, uh, you know, transformed his own life as it transformed uh, um, my life also thereafter. And as I read the book, I, I was telling my son that I'm reading this children's book and it's about the sun and the moon. And he was like, would you ask the author if he normally writes these kinds of stories where you have to use your imagination? Um, yes. Um, <laughs> so, well, it's a bit of uh, imagination, a bit of reality. You know, the, the one reality is, you know, is reality is we struggle of, uh, with children. Well, mm. I've struggled with them. Fortunately, they're not much bigger, but now I have <laughs> different struggles <laughs> with them. <laughs> University, the teenagers and <laughs> adults now. Um, but, you know, the, the daily struggle of, you know, getting them to brush their teeth, getting them to eat <laughs> their meals, getting them to behave. So that's the reality. So the book is based on the reality of the reality of, you know, getting them to go to bed on time so they can be all awake and fresh and energized, for, you know, to go to school the next day and then of course getting them out of bed to get to school. To you, <laughs> you know, you really have to cajole them. So it, that's based in reality. And then also the environment is based in reality. You know, our, our environment is just so vulnerable now. And, you know, we, and, and the importance, especially for the young generation to understand our ecosystem and that they will, you know, will have to take care of the system, our system in a way we adults and, you know, our old people have not done. And that is why we are sitting, you know, with environmental problems. Um, and it is important, um, even if you're in an informal settlement that you, you know, that you take care of your environment. I mean, I do remember, and I mean, I only look back at it now, and, you know, I grew up with a single mother, and uh, we're mostly boys. And uh, in an informal settlement, my mother absolutely made certain that we clean it every day outside, we had plants, we had to clean outside. And I could never understand why we were to be. We seem to be the only people doing this. Uh, uh, but it is very important, uh, even at that level, that one begins to learn about your environment and you know, taking care of it. There's a dignity also around one's environment, of, you know, keeping it um, uh, clean. Um, uh, and, so on. and is there a particular age group for this book? So, I mean, you know, I always target sort of from as little as possible, you know, six months upwards, um, sort of, I think, you know, up to 10 years. But, you know, often um, um, we struggle with children um, even older that they cannot read. So this hopefully would be even at that age would be, be reading. I mean, before I wrote a book before a couple of years ago, um, and it was, I wrote it for children who still in, well, for mothers, but children still, um, when they're still pregnant with children and when they're just newborn. And the idea was, when I wrote it, was for men to read um, um, for their children, even when the, ch the child, you know, is, uh, is still in the valley. Uh, and immediately thereafter, so that it's, you know, how important it is, you know, that the reading from early on for the vocabulary, um, you know, for the child, for the confidence of the child, and for the bonding of the child, you know, reading, the reading, the adult, and particularly, you know, black males, because we don't have a culture um, of reading, um, um, you, you know, to children, and, but because that reading, it brings a closeness, brings a bonding, uh, and so on, you know, that cannot be replaced. And yet, you know, as African cultures, we've got a storytelling culture. Um, you know, I grew up and I'm still lucky enough, you know, that period in the 1970s, where the stories were told. Uh, we were sitting around the galley fires at, at night and uh, stories were told. But, you know, increasingly, that's not, you know, the, even those type of stories are not being told. You know, adults are not 
telling stories anymore to children because there's often also the reality, you know, you have to wake up early in the morning to go to work. You know, most black South Africans are up at five, four o'clock to get to work in, in town and they come back home late. So, you know, that bonding opportunity is, is, is often lacking and often missing in our contemporary times. And how can uh, us as parents access this book? And are there plans in future to get the printed version of this book? So this book is online, um, particularly now, you know, during our COVID-19 period, you know, um, when we, our movements are restricted. Um, so it can be downloaded. Um, it can be downloaded on the mobile phone. It can be downloaded on, you know, on the laptop, on the computer. Mm -hmm. And um, so, I mean, I do plan once, you know, we lift, uh, lockdown uh, lifters and we're back to normal. I don't know how the new normal will look, look <laughs> like. Uh, but when we get back there to bring out a paper version of the book. So I'm working on that. So presumably, I think most probably in early next year uh, when, um, you know, when we're out of, when we post COVID-19, hopefully. And how would you encourage a uh, organizations like the book clubs uh, who normally do these kinds of sessions when they gather and read. Uh, surely they, some of the members would have kids. How, how would you encourage them to disseminate this book uh, to other parents as well as other community members since it's a free book? Yes, I mean, you know, um, fortunately I think there's been a growing, the last couple of years, growing book clubs, um, but it's been mostly for adults. So I think we have to start thinking about how do we, can we create book clubs for children also at that level? Um, so I, I hope people, you know, can think about it because even at a community level where there's no rural areas or towns or areas or informal settlements, it will be part of community building, part of building solidarity, you know, of community togetherness. If we could have book clubs in informal set settlements and townships um, in rural areas, I try, whenever I launch an adult book, I always do a reading, um, you know, in the local library, in townships, with schools, you know, that's always be part of my program. And often, you know, I get invited a lot um, to, 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 to talk in public speaking. Um, and then I often, if it's out of town, I often spend the extra day to go to a local school and to read. Um, to a township school to read uh, with children and I always try to do an exercise um, uh, with them so all of the books are, I write in such a way that one can do a bit of an exercise, a learning exercise and hopefully get people excited, maybe do a bit of drawing also, make people get, uh, children excited and um, my dream really is if we could um, in the post-COVID-19 era establish children book clubs, um, you know every street could have one um, uh, you know, around the country. But also, I think it's been very tricky. I haven't tried it, but I've been thinking of, <laughs> I must do it, of reading for children online <laughs> to Zoom. <laughs> I have spoken to a few people, uh, well, bookstores, and, and I, you know, to work on it to see how to do it. Um, so I have a standing invitation to, um, to do it because that's going to be important, you know, how to, to do it that way. Even with schools now, um, you know, even if children are um, at home, um, whether one could do this type of reading for schools, uh, you know, with the permission of schools, of, of course, um, where every child at home, if they have access, um, um, you know, to, uh, to online, and of course, sadly in our country, not many children have access, but those who have access, um, you know, if one could read online for them, if they at home, one person reads and you know a couple of hundred children follow the story I can ask questions and comment on it and so okay. and and that got me thinking of how would you encourage us as parents because I know some parents would be like okay I, I bought these books for my children but then I don't read with them how what what are the benefits of us uh, giving ourselves time in these busy days and times but just to read with our kids. You know, it, it, you know I cannot emphasize how important it is. It's, it's absolutely important. So yes, you buy the book for the child, but uh, well, and this book is free, um, so it's a free online, um, is to 
read, you know, five minutes of reading, because the thing is about reading is in our busy lives, the act of reading for the child actually brings the bonding, that closeness. And, you know, the thing about reading, it's the closeness is much more intense. Because as you read, and, and I've been reading for my children, you know, since they were in their mother's belly, um, and I'm still reading for my youngest one, who's 14 years old, the other side, I'm old now, uh, but I still read him a newspaper, part of a newspaper article, but I don't get very far, like after the first paragraph, so boring. But um, for the little one, you know, to read, because what it, you know, it's a, when we talk about quality time, a f even a five or 10 minutes of reading brings that quality time, this intenseness, was it body closeness, you know, to hear your voice, um, as you describe, they'll ask you questions. And even if it's every day, just that five or 10 minutes, you don't have any other time, it really is important bonding. And also one could always ask them, especially if they're very little, as one is busy cooking or doing whatever one is doing and or driving, for them to read aloud um, in the car or, or, or wherever, or walking and, 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 and read aloud. Um, and so on, because, you know, that interaction and that engagement really builds up, you know, it's uh, love in a, in, a, in a different way. Um, and in, in one, you know, build a closeness and a connectedness, you, you know, between, you know, the parent and the child. Mm. And have you had any feedback from, from the parents who have managed to download uh, the book online? Yes, I do. And I must tell you, just in general terms, I've been very surprised because now these days I get approached by children <laughs> about books and then they ask me, are you writing another book? <laughs> and so, which is very, and I get introduced through children, introduced me to their parents. So I, yeah, I find sometimes I'm a bit <laughs> sort of baffled <laughs> because I'm not used to that. Normally I engage in politics with the parents. They, <laughs> they see me and they say, well, I didn't agree with your comment <laughs> or that book, you know, or that article, you know, <laughs> I have a different opinion. Uh, but uh, the exciting thing now is children are engaging um, and say, well, um, tell me, what did you mean by this? Or, you know, or they want aspects of the story. They want to, you know, I have to tell them. And then they ask me, how do you write these books? And what other books are you writing? And then I often explain to them you know, sort of the projects and, and how long these projects take. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, let's hope then uh, with you writing these children's books and even talking to them uh, will encourage more authors uh, who will be writing, especially children's books. So can we expect another book in the future? Absolutely. Hopefully you can expect many books in the future. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm working on, oh, there's a couple of exit done. Yeah, so we're working on it. But I must tell you, it's it really is important, especially in African communities, that we tell our own stories. And um, for me, really, that's the most important thing. Um, you know, I do worry, um, you know, that we don't tell our own stories because it's, telling our own stories, we it's important for us because you know during apartheid, during colonialism, um, you know, we were our stories were written out. We're not taken serious. We're not credible. Um, and so, so it's very important that, you know, because all of us and, and, and I often, whenever I talk to communities on other issues, I always bring the storytelling in because I think it's important because, you know, to affirm ourselves, to affirm our own stories, affirm our, our lives, affirm, you know, you know, our beings, how we live to affirm it, you know, it is worth it. And because we don't, if we go into a bookstore, we don't see many stories, you know, from black people, we don't see how people grew up, what people think, what people love, you know, how do, how do people overcome um, uh, difficult things, those stories. Uh, and, and I fear, you know, that after every generation, the stories are forgotten or the stories that our, our parents told us and our grandparents that, you know, it, it just disappear uh, out of that. And especially, especially in the world now where, you know, people don't have time to tell stories to their children or their nieces or their nephews, you know, because everyone is just in a rush. And hopefully, I hope that the COVID-19 period, because, you know, it forces us all close to one house because we couldn't go anywhere else, that hopefully people were telling their stories, the parents were telling their stories the way they grew up, 
um, you know, how they overcome some of the challenges, um, their views on, on life, what informed their lives, how they've changed their lives, it, it, uh, and so on. Because it really is an important part of our identity. Because if we don't tell our stories and if we don't validate those stories, you know, something is missing about us, our identity is missing. And also from a South African point of view, if, we, if black people don't tell the stories enough, I think what will happen is if you know, somebody from another country comes to us or somebody from Mars comes down to South Africa, they'll say, we are the black people, <laughs> the black people living here. Uh, because you know, there's the stories I'm missing. Um, you go into a bookstore, it's just one particular community, but there's no black communities are not telling the stories. And it's very important to give us, the, give South Africa the collective history and that all of our histories is important. And that is why it's so, um, every story is important. Every life is important. No one's story, no one's life is, in, um, is insignificant. And for me, that's a really important, and particularly for black people, you know, your story matters, your life matters, your experience matters. It's unique, it's yours, and it's part of the bigger story of the country. Therefore, it must be told. That was Professor William Kumete in conversation with Polity about his book titled Upside Down World.